is brought to you by the Jonas Podcasting Network, found exclusively at wrestlingwithjonas.com. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Wrestling With Jonas. and today I've got an awesome guest, uh, none other than the SWA champion and the current WEW World Heavyweight Champion, Zach Zodiac, Zach Knight. Zach, thank you for coming on the show, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me, buddy. Uh, I was getting excited about that intro there. I was like, hell yeah. Uh, and I, I missed out the best part. One of the best wrestling talents in the UK in 2022. How does that sound? That sounds great. I need to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, like I said, we're going to be live for the next 60 or so minutes speaking to uh, Zach Knight. Uh, all about his professional wrestling career, growing up in the uh, the legendary Knight family in the UK over here. And what a fantastic 2022 Zach's had. Uh, but if you want to get in touch, you can do. Uh, we are streaming live across Facebook Live, YouTube and Twitch. So please get in touch. Send us your questions through to uh, Zach Knight, uh, Zach Zodiac, and we'll do our very best to bring them up and to answer every single one live on air. But uh, first of all, Zach, I say coming out of lockdown 2021 going into 2022, looking at the last 12 months, my friend. Um, you've had a, a phenomenal year. Um, thinking back on everything you've achieved, and we will take a deep dive into all of that in detail, but thinking back in a nutshell, it's been a hell of a 12 months for you, hasn't it? It's been fantastic. You know, I think most wrestlers dream of the year that I've had. Um, you know, obviously during lockdown, I think when you're away from something you love so much, um, you know, you start getting the itch for it. You start missing it. Be, being in this uh, industry my entire life, you know, sometimes that you lose the love of the industry, especially when you feel like you're not getting nowhere. So lockdown for me was probably one of the best things that could have happened for me personally, because it really got my love for professional wrestling back. And uh, I trained hard during that time. And uh, I think the rewards have uh, shown itself in 2022. Yeah. And you saw it as a bit of a reset, did you, Zach? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, going into the pandemic, the first thing that, you know, I was worried about and equally so was my wife was my mental health. Mm. Um, you know, it's no secret. I've been quite open about it five years ago. I had a, a breakdown, you know, and I suffered quite severely with mental health. Um, so it was finding something to keep me occupied. None of us knew how long the pandemic was going to last for or how long we were going to be locked down for, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and the first thing we'd done was we started doing Tyson Fury's home workouts on Instagram. Nice. Um, and once I got into, you know, a, a routine of doing this daily, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with how you felt, you know, you, you the energy levels was were rising. You know, I, I felt like I had more energy to run around with my kids. I wanted to be active. I wanted to play. You know, I was going out for a run. I just, I don't know, I fell in love with that feeling of making yourself feel better. And, you know, the home workout certainly done that. And it become highly addictive. And as soon as you start seeing a transformation and a change in your appearance, uh, I think that's the most addictive part about it. So, yeah, I sort of went crazy after that and started hitting the gym once we were allowed. Absolutely. Well, we'll look at this picture here. And uh, I'd say uh, you're a prime fighting weight. You're the, the, the prize fighter there, Zach. So uh, um, obviously, you know, there's been a bit of, trans bit of a transformation for yourself over the last 12 months. But uh, included within that, is this new moniker, this new persona, the prize fighter. So tell us a bit about that. So boxing's always been a love of mine. Uh, my brother Roy and my dad specifically are crazy boxing fans. You know, any boxing match they're watching. Um, so, you know, I was brought up with that. Um, I, I trained in boxing for many years. Never had any fights or anything like that. Not legal ones inside a ring anyway. Um, you know, there's been some, uh, there have been some punch ups, but, yeah, I, I fell in. I fell in love with you know the the discipline of boxing and how tough it was. Um, you know, people don't give these boxers enough credit. They train, you know, to with, with their all to the best of their ability, and it is tough work. Um, but I'm all for it. You know, the harder it is, the better the rewards. Um, so when we come out of the pandemic, I was actually going to do a white collar boxing match. Um, and that was scheduled to happen in October of 21, I believe it was. Um, but we'd done some holiday camps uh, throughout the summer, uh, and I had a horrific injury where I split my kneecap. 
Um, mm. And I had to have stitches uh, inside and outside. So the fight got pushed back. But I fell in love with the training, uh, like the, the boxing camp, so to speak. I put myself in for eight to 12 weeks with my coach, fell in love with it. Um, you know, learning the combos and the punches and the techniques and everything like that. Um, you know, people label my family as, as a fighting family, uh, even though, you know, I've had three fights in my life, uh, <laughs> you know, never been in trouble or anything like that. You know, the aura around the family, the, the stigma that carries us as, as fighting men, I decided to embrace it. You know, I was like, if people are going to label me with this, then I'm going to become the prize fighter uh, and I'm going to start adding some striking ability to my to my wrestling techniques. So that's sort of where the prize fighter come from. And to be honest, that's one of the best things I've ever done. Yeah, and you've certainly noticed it in your matches and in your in-ring performance. And uh, it's added another another gear to your kind of in-ring ability, another kind of uh, string to your bow, another element to your game. But uh, first off, I want to talk about this. From this past weekend's Ricky Knight Jr., the current British uh, heavyweight champion of Rev Pro, against yourself, of course. And uh, I know you're no stranger to... Uh, uh, fighting with other members of your family. We'll talk about that later on. But RKJ is having a, an amazing year in his own right. He's having an amazing few years, actually. But uh, this year's definitely been his year. Oh, 2022. Absolutely. 2022 has been an amazing year for yourself as well, Zach. And to get the two of you in the ring at the same time, when you're both at the peak of your uh, conditioning, at the peak of your abilities and performance inside the ring, um, I haven't seen the match yet, but I can only assume it was a hard-hitting encounter. It was it was phenomenal, you know. Uh, I think we give the fans everything that they expected, you know. Um, we felt each other out, you know, stuck to our traditions of honouring the British wrestling, uh, yeah. and it just kept creeping forward. You know, there was gear changes. Uh, you know, we really did go in and and give each other some good wax. I actually posted this picture today. <laughs> Look at that! A, a picture that tells a thousand that. words, doesn't it? Eh? Well, it does. I said, I love wrestling my family. They bring the best out of you, you know, uh, but they also hit you like you owe them money. You know, RKJ is a tough competitor. You know, if anyone's outdone me this year on the UK scene, it's RKJ, you know, winning the, the Rev Pro Undisputed British Heavyweight Championship, just won the MPS with Progress as well. Yeah. You know, he's having an absolute blinder and uh, he's doing that 10 years younger than what I did. It's crazy to think that at 31, I'm reaching my prime. Uh, and starting to get, you know, my, myself out there as a, a solo wrestler, whereas RKJ has been doing this the last sort of couple of years, especially, uh, and is knocking out of the park. But I would actually go to say that's probably one of my top five matches in my career uh, at Rev Pro this Sunday. It was absolutely phenomenal. And the kid, I'm telling you now, RKJ is going to make it. Absolutely. He's having an amazing year. I've seen a lot of RKJ this year. Um, and uh, like I say, I know that 2023 is going to be a great year for yourself and for RKJ. Um, that's one of many highlights from 2022. I think the majority of this interview is going to be talking about what a phenomenal 2022 has been for yourself. Uh, but what about this, Zach? Yeah. Stepping inside a new Japan ring for the first time, Royal Quest 2, uh, October the 1st and October the 2nd this year at the Crystal Palace National Sports uh, Arena. Now, I, I was there on night one and I got to see you uh, wrestle in uh, that tag match. Um, but uh, enlighten us. T tell us about your experience of wrestling at Royal Quest 2. Um, first of all, you must have been thrilled to have been a part of it because I think originally, uh, wasn't it um, uh, Jonah Rock that was meant to have been on the show? Um, right. And then to our delight, you were there instead. Yeah, so obviously Jonah got stuck in what I believe was maybe Hurricane Ian, I think. Uh, don't right. quote me on the name, but, you know, the, the guy was stranded. He couldn't get across from Florida. Um, so I actually got a phone call from Andy Quild, an owner of Rev Pro, about 8.30 at night. Um, sorry, it wasn't wow. even a phone call. It was a message. It was a message on Messenger saying, what are you doing tomorrow? Can you wrestle for New Japan Royal Quest? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I actually went giddy. I was kind of like, wow, this is huge. You know, I've I've wrestled maybe three or four times for Rev Pro at the moment. There's so many guys that Andy could put in right now, and he's messaged me. So I must have, you know, made a good account of myself. I think I wrestled Shota Umino a couple of weeks before that. And we had a fantastic match, you know, really, really good. Again, probably up there in, you know, my top three matches of 2022. Um, so he calls me up. Can you get there? Uh, and I'm like, yes, I can. What do you need? He said, I need you to fill in for Jonah in a tag match. And I'm like, okay, I haven't actually seen the card. Who am I working? 
He was like, um, you're going to be working Tomohiro Ishii and Okada. Man, my mind was blown. <laughs> blown. I'm like, Jesus, you know. What a way are- to make your debut, eh? I know it's incredible, right? You know, I listen, a debut's a debut. I would have gone in there with one of their young boys and we'd have torn it up and, you know, I'd, I've enjoyed it just as much. But just to say that on my debut, I wrestled Okada and Ishii, you know, not many people can brag about that. No. Um, you know, and, and what a phenomenal moment. Both those guys and my tag partner, you know, Bad, bad Boy Tito, Bad Man Tito, um, you know, he... He was brilliant. You know, he he welcomed me with with open arms. Um, you know, if you actually watch the footage, we got in the ring. And I know that Tito's been around for a while, but I actually said to him, suck it in, bro. You know, let, let's enjoy this type thing. And he's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm ready type thing. Um, uh, they made their entrances. And I'm going to be honest, as soon as they were in the ring, all my nerves and everything went. I was like, okay. I know I can do this. I know I'm good at this. I'm now in there with two of the very best, uh, a good platform to showcase myself. And they were so accommodating. Ishi let me do the buckle bomb with the sleeper, you know, which is my finisher and won me a lot of matches this year. And Okada come and broke it up. And, you know, they were just so gracious and 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 loving and humble. It was a real honor to step in there with, you know, two professionals that love this industry as much as I do and had the fans at the root of their heart and thought process of this match. It was a real honour, and I hope to, I get to do it again. Absolutely. Well, let's just bring up some pictures. First of all, the crowd. Uh, they were loud. They were raucous. They were on their feet, um, and that match as well. Uh, there you are with Ishii, laying yeah. it in, laying it in, my friends. And then, of course, Okada, uh, like I say, making your New Japan Pro Wrestling debut against one of the very, very best of Japanese legends, uh, arguably one of the best in the world. Um, but uh, we do have a question that came in earlier on. Now, let me just select the right question here. Uh, what was your overall experience of Royal Quest uh, and any backstage stories or insights on what the event was like overall? So uh, um, obviously, you know, you had the, the Japanese contingent, you had uh, a lot of the uh, American t- contingent and uh, a lot of top UK talent backstage. But uh, um, any, any kind of any happenings backstage or kind of who did you bump into? Who did you have conversation with and any fun stories? Um, so, yeah, obviously, I met everyone that was on the show. Um, and to be honest with you, in, in a dressing room full of top talent, you'd think there'd be a lot of friction and egos. But in actual fact, you know, everyone embraced each other. It doesn't matter if you were a top UK guy, Japanese guy, American, whatever you were, you know, you were there because you deserved to be there. And everyone welcomed you with open arms. You know, um, to be honest with you, after my match, uh, you know, I sort of got the nod from both the wrestlers. Uh, the president, um, Obari, he come up to me and was like, you know, great job, um, you know, come again tomorrow, uh, which I honestly thought I was going to get another match on the second day, um, you know, but th- that wasn't meant to be for a number of reasons. Number one being I got a phone call at like five to three in the afternoon telling me that my uncle had just passed away. Um, so they put me in the VIP section, you know, they brought me uh, a Chinese, <laughs> they bought me a chow mein nice. and some, <laughs> you know, some drinks and basically just said, look, yeah. there's anything that we can do, Zach, don't hesitate to ask, you know, um, to be honest, I was treated like a celebrity as was everyone there. Um, you know, I've not got a bad word to say about the experience, the talent that was backstage, anyone there, we all had the same goal and that was to entertain the four plus thousand fans that come through that weekend. So, you know, unfortunately I've got no real gossip for you. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, these, no, these are good guys. Yeah, no salacious gossip there, Chris Martin. Thank you for your question. We really, really appreciate it. We've had lots of questions come through, but uh, just a few people that have uh, uh, reached out. Uh, let's have a look here. So we've got uh, Tommy Lambert, uh, the Suffolk madman, watching via YouTube, uh, the main man, Zach. Um, and of course, Sammy J, watching via YouTube. Yes, there's the prize fighter. What a legend. Nobody's going <laughs> to argue with that. Um, Uh, Let's have a quick look. Japan then. I I don't know if you've ever been to or wrestled or performed over in Japan, uh, Zach. Is is that maybe on your bucket list something you'd like to do? Now that you've got that connection with Rev Pro and New Japan, maybe is that a bit of a a bucket list for yourself? Yeah, I mean, in 2015, me and Roy wrestled Juice and Thunder Liger at uh, Super Clash 2, I think it was. Um, You know, and after that, uh, Liger went straight back. 
put us over um and we we actually got an email saying that we can go uh to their to their gym uh stay with them for a couple of months etc um but unfortunately and i regret this decision i'm not gonna lie you know what a stupid man i was um to me back then it was like well i, I can't justify going there for two three months not earning no 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 money or real money uh to send home to my wife and two children at the time um you know and Roy was in the same situation um you know so we graciously declined um you know there's been a couple of stories that way you know ring of honor was another one um you know unfortunately it just seems like the stars never really aligned properly for us yeah. um so yeah i've never competed in japan um i can say uh, nothing's promised yet, but I am in talks of a couple of companies in Japan that are asking me to go out there in 2023. Um, but I also have to use my brain on this one because I am linked now with Rev Pro. I know they've got ties to New Japan. I don't want to shoot myself in the foot with that company, uh, but I certainly want to tick it off the bucket list to make sure that I wrestle in Japan. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, another question that came through during the live stream from a Tommy Lambert again. Now he's interested to know about the language difference and uh, was it difficult to work the new Japan guys with the language barrier and calling moves, etc., or do they both speak good English? And uh, you know, wrestling is a language of its own anyway, Zach. But uh, how did you manage in there with the the Japanese talent? Well, yeah, you said it right. Wrestling's a language of its own. Um, you know, actually, they speak uh, very good English. I wouldn't say perfect, but it's definitely broken English. You can definitely understand what they're asking you. Um, you know, wrestling's like a dance, it's a performance, you know. So once you're backstage and you're you're locking up and you're moving around a little bit anyway, you know exactly what they want you to do. Um, but we were very lucky. Uh, the referee, you you show a picture a minute ago, he was behind the scenes. His English was phenomenal, in fact, better than mine. Um, so he was translating for us and making sure that we understood exactly what um Ishii and Okada wanted from us, and, and vice versa. Um, so you know, we we were lucky. And I think, obviously, you know, they, they would have had translators there for us anyway. Um, but Ishii, I spoke to after the match, you know, his English isn't phenomenal, but we managed to have a bit of a chat. He was asking me about my career and how long that spanned and, you know, asking about the rest of the family and stuff like that. And um, Okada was was great, you know, uh, the same. His English was a lot better, um, you know, a bit more of a private man, um, but, you know, definitely made his presence known backstage and introduced himself to everyone, which you don't really have to do, but I'm so glad that he had that old school mentality to introduce yeah. and shake people's hands. That was a, that was a real eye opener as well. And knowing that I've been brought in the right, right way and, and still doing things the right way by making yourself known in the dress rooms and shaking everyone's hands. Class act. Absolutely. And uh, this dropped yesterday, I think. Now, you mentioned yes. Ishii. You fought him in that tag match at Royal Quest 2 uh, last month, uh, October the 1st, actually. And uh, it was announced very, very recently that on December the 17th, York Hall, uh, you will be going one-on-one -on -one with the big man, uh, Tomohiro Ishii. Uh, that's a pretty tasty prospect, isn't it? That's going to be a tasty encounter between two big guys that know how to hit hard. Uh, and don't mind getting hit hard also, Zach. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to that one? I am. I'm really looking forward to it. So this will be my single debut at York Hall. Um, I've been there a couple of times with my brother Roy as the hooligans, you know, wrestling for the, the Rev Pro Tag Team Championships. One that spring to mind is against Mark, uh, sorry, Mark Haskins and uh, Joel Redman. We had a great match. The, the crowd absolutely loved that. We took it all over the building. But to be in there with Ishii, you know, uh, my goal of 2022 was to start wrestling the big names, you know, the people that are respected, the people that when you get in that ring, you know, they're, they're kind of doubting whether you are going to win or not. Because, you know, obviously my, my home company, which will always be my home is WAW. Um, but most of the guys there I've trained and, you know, sort of help them find their foot in wrestling and stuff like that. So the fans kind of sit there and they're like, well, I can't see him really beating Zach, you know, but it's nice to actually go on with, with wrestlers that have got a really good history, you know, the fans are backing them. I become the underdog, you know, uh, obviously ishi has got a few more years on me in the business as well. I'm, I'm a 20 year um, wrestling pro now, but I know ishi has got a little bit more than me. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And the bit I'm really excited about is what you mentioned and that's getting in there and actually going toe to toe and uh, making sure I feel every blow so that I'll wake up uh, Sunday morning 
I feel like I've been in a fight. There's nothing more <laughs> enjoyable than that. You know, so I'm urging Ishii, bring the chops, bring the forearms, bring them lariats, bring everything you've got. Because, uh, you know, no one's going to hurt me like I once hurt myself. So uh, I'll be urging him and I'll be telling him in the ring in front of the fans, you know, bloody bring it. Give me what you've got because it's, you're going to have to take absolutely everything from me that night because it's my time to shine. And, you know, it's another massive opportunity that I've got to take on December the 17th. Absolutely. And I, I can see that when you two start exchanging blows, the crowd are going to be on their feet, uh, urging that one to go to the next level. I'm sure it will. Um, this is a podcast all about you, but we have to briefly talk about your sister and that yes. match there. Now, her long awaited return to a wrestling ring after about five years, I think. Um, yep. Soraya made a return recently signed with AEW and uh, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dr. Britt Baker at uh, AEW's recent pay-per-view, Full Gear. Uh, there you are in the front row and uh, you got credited at the bottom there as a 20-year professional wrestler um, and, of course, uh, well-known uh, brother to Soraya and uh, a very emotional occasion for yourself and for the whole family. Um, but uh, what, what did it mean to you, Zach, to be out there to support your sister on such a momentous occasion for her and for the whole family, her return after what we thought would probably never happen. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm glad you answered this, asked this question because a lot of people, you know, they're assuming I'm trying to ride Soraya's coattails when in actual fact, Soraya messaged me saying, you know, bro, I've been cleared. Um, you know, I need to get in the ring. I need to train. Um, you know, so straight away, I'm like, hell yeah, fly me out there. Let's Let's go. So, you know, my original reason for going out there was to help her get her ring fitness back, you know, to get in there and spar a little bit, get a movement, maybe come up with some different moves that are going to protect her. You know, she she has to protect that neck now. Yes, she's yeah. been given the 100 percent clearance, but at the same time, you've got to work smart. Um, and that's what it was all about. So, you know, I flew out there. Uh, I was scheduled to go to Dynamite, which, you know, I'd done. Uh, I got to meet everyone backstage, including Tony. You know, we had a good chat and stuff. Um, and it was at that point they said to me, is there any chance that you could stay for full gear? Um, to which I had BWR the Friday and Rev Pro the Sunday in Sheffield, where I was originally meant to wrestle Ricky. Right. Um, so I messaged BWR and I said to him, look, you know, they've asked me to stay. This is a, a huge opportunity. No, I'm not wrestling. But at the same time, you know, any time on TV, you know, whether it's 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, your face is being seen. And, you know, I'm trying to let people know that I'm still grinding. I'm still here. Zach Zodiac is still aiming for the stars and, and for the big leagues and stuff. So, you know, when, when I see that name bar come up the next day, I was taken back, you know. Um, a lot of people were like, well, it says Soraya's brother. Well, state the bloody obvious, mate. I am yeah. Soraya's brother, you know, but take that away. They've credited me as a 20-year veteran of the UK. That was humbling, man. You know, I, I'm still a young man. I, I'm 31 years old, and I still class myself as a young boy in this business that is still eager, still willing to learn, you know, still taking these silly bumps to get noticed. And, you know, who, who cares about a bump card at this stage? You know, that's me. So for AEW to credit me with that and put my wrestling name, I was so humbled. Uh, really taken back and I couldn't wait to share it to all my family and friends on my socials. I just, I was made up. Yeah, absolutely. And I was super chuffed when I was watching the pay-per-view and saw you there front row, like you say, name bar, and then the uh, the embrace after the match. Uh, both yourself and Saray must have been really pleased with how the match went. Obviously, she was unscathed um, and performed fantastic. It almost looked like she hadn't missed the beat, Zach. Yeah, well, the thing is, obviously, you know, from the get-go, the obvious thing is we need to protect Soraya. You know, yeah. this is her first match back. We can do as much training as you want, but when you're live in front of 15,000 people, the adrenaline's up, you're <laughs> sucking wind, you know, accidents can happen. So, you know, when I was out there, Soraya actually asked me to help produce her match, which I was really honoured about. Um, you know, obviously they've got producers that are being paid out there, but I was welcoming welcome in with open arms with a, a gentleman called BJ and Dean Malenko, um, you know, they were very supportive of some of the ideas that I come up with. Um, you know, I sort of helped structure it, not loads, but enough for me to know I left my fingerprints on the match. Um, you know, and I know people have got their opinions on it and this that, and the other, but you know, Tony Storm and Jamie Hayter were the girls to go out there and you know, get it into sixth gear and, and show people, you know, what Soraya had, had opened 
10 years ago, you know, yeah. which is time for the girls, for the girls to go out there and show that they're just as good. And for me, that was probably the best match of the pay-per-view was Tony and Jamie Hayter. I'm not gonna, Nothing. I'm not gonna deny it, you know. Um, <clears throat> but for me, it was making sure that Soraya walked in, you know, walk out the same way she walked in. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a great match, a great story. You know, it was about the comeback of a woman that, you know, helped build the revolution. And then you've got a woman on the other side that has built AEW from the ground up and been the face of the division. And it's, can Soraya still go with the top girl in the world? You know, and that was the story. The fans appreciated it. Both walked out injury free. Um, you know, and yeah, she didn't look like she missed a beat. Uh, I'm excited to see what the upcoming matches are. Uh, and I know that she's already back in the gym training, you know, getting her wind up and, and making sure that she keeps kicking ass. That's what Soraya do. She's an inspiration. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and, and being backstage kind of amongst all of the fantastic uh, world, world-class world talent, let's be honest, backstage at AEW, it must have been a huge motivational force for you to think, yeah, I want a piece of this myself. Yeah. Like, like I said, um, you know, when you walk into AEW, you know, a sort of, Eyes and ears open, mouth shut. You know, you want to be seen, but you don't want to be heard. You know, um, that's the way I was brought up in this business. I tried to keep my head down. But as the days went on, I just got more comfortable. You know, these, they really are so welcoming. There's no one there that feels like they're above anyone else. You know, um, they'll all go ringside. They'll all chat. They'll all help each other. You know, they've all got that same vision, which is to move AEW forward collectively as one. They know that one person can't do it. It's a team effort to move this juggernaut forward. Um, and there's a real family feel there. You could see that, you know, they're they're all wanting to do it to, to benefit themselves and the company and the brand, you know. So it was a real honor to be a part of that week. You know, Dynamite, Rampage, uh, you know, Dark, Dark Elevation, Full Gear. You know, I was a part of every single, you know, one of them shows. And, you know, it was a real eye-opener. Um, but as time went on, you know, I, I don't know whether I'm going to get heat for saying this, but it went from, man, I wish I was here to this is where I should be. Yeah. You know, and 100%. I'm a firm believer in you have to believe in yourself. You know, if you ask Tyson Fury who the best boxer in the world is, his answer would be Tyson Fury. You know, and, and that's how I am with me. I believe that I'm the best all round professional wrestler the UK has to offer. And I say all round. Because, you know, I've really worked on every style of this industry. You know, there's none that are more flamboyant than the other. You know, collectively, I've amalgamated a style from learning everything there is to learn. And I'm not saying I know everything. Because in wrestling, one of the magic parts of wrestling is you never stop learning. Um, so this is what excites me to keep pushing forward, keep learning, you know, keep perfecting my craft. And uh, maybe one day I will stand with the elites um, and say, you know what, I worked hard to get here and I deserve to be here. Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to bring up a poster now, um, and it's AEW are coming to the UK. AEW are coming to London in 2023. Uh, might we see a certain Zach Zodiac on one of those shows or maybe the show in London? But uh, it would be awesome if you if you were given the opportunity. But uh, you don't need to let any cats out of any bag, Zach. But uh, um, I'd say that would that, be another feather in your cap, surely. Listen, they're coming to London. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to get on that show, to give myself an opportunity, the big stage in front of my home fans. You know, I, I, I honestly think that if there's a show that my name was meant to be on, it's this one. But the problem is there's no dates. You know, we don't even know where it's going, what's happened or anything exactly. yet. So the last thing they're going to do is contact talent and tell them, listen, you're going to be on a show. I haven't got the date or the venue or the time or anything, but you're on it. You know, they know better than that. You know, we my life can't be put on hold in the hope that I'm going to get that. You know, right now, 2023 is looking hectic. Um, you know, Germany, France, Italy, Australia, America, hopefully Japan is another one. Um, you know, these countries and companies, they're all coming forward and they want me there. So I've just got to keep grinding and moving forward. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping my fingers are crossed. If people keep supporting me the way they are on socials and, you know, there's there's a little hashtag going around at the moment. Sign Zach Zodiac. You know, it doesn't matter if two people do it. I'm so humbled by it. There's two people that believe in me as much as I believe in myself, you know, so fingers crossed, John, I think is the answer. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can kind of envision. Now that we've put it out into the universe, Zach, it's got to happen. It's got to happen. But uh, fingers crossed, like you say. And uh, we have had more questions come through. and We will be bringing them up during the course of the interview. Uh, but uh, sticking with 2022 for the meantime, and we've got to talk about Shropshire Wrestling Alliance and uh, your, your recent victories at uh, your home promotion, WAW. Uh, tell us a bit about Shropshire Wrestling Alliance, because you've had a good run with them, and you've recently become uh, their new heavyweight champion. Going to bring up a couple of pictures here, uh, but look at that. The man's done good as their uh, new heavyweight champion of SWA. Um, one of a couple of straps that you're holding at the moment, probably more than that, um, but you must be pretty proud of that accomplishment. Yeah, listen, you know, uh, I know that a lot of the old school will say a belt is a prop to help get people over, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's a real honor when a, when a promoter comes up to me and say, look, Zach, I want to make you the heavyweight champion. That means I'm the face of their company. They want me to be the locker room leader. They want me to help take their company forward. Um, so when Luke said to me, look, Zach, you know, I want you to be the SWA heavyweight champion, you know, straight away, it was it was a real honor for me. You know, and um, I went in there with Big Gun Joe uh, and Kid Like Us uh, in a freeway match. You know, all three of us give our absolute all. And it was a fantastic match, you know, and any three of us could have walked out the champion. Um, but again, I was honored when Luke said to me, Zach, take this and, and help us move SWA forward. He's already booked me for a number of shows for 2023. Uh, I know he's trying to bring the very best that the world has to offer um, to challenge me for that title. Uh, and that, for me, is what 2023 is about. You know, I want to work the world's very best. Whoever that may be, you know, put me in that ring and let me showcase that I deserve to be put in that same league, that same category. Um, but, yeah, going back, SWA, great company, you know, ran by Luke and his missus. And, you know, they're great people and a good locker room. That's all you yeah. can really ask for when you go into these promotions, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have to talk about this one here then. Uh, yourself against Roy with Soraya. We've spoken a bit about Soraya already, but she came back over to the UK as a special referee for your match. Uh, and it was a title versus title, wasn't it? And uh, uh, let's just bring up a couple more pictures here. There you are after the match. Now, this is a bit of a spoiler for anybody that doesn't know the result <laughs> or uh, hasn't seen the event. Uh, but Zach walked away as the uh, the new and the three-time WAW Undisputed World Heavyweight Champion. Let's not forget, three times. Um, so a great event. It was Fightmare 4, wasn't it? Uh, in 4. October, I think. And uh, yep. a great card, absolutely stacked with international talent. But that main event, uh, Zach versus Roy for the uh, for, for all the gold with Soraya in the middle, um, trying to keep order between the two brothers. Couldn't have been easy for her. But uh, tell us about that whole experience. It looked absolutely fantastic and, and a great uh, occasion for yourself as well. Yeah, so we were, you know, just a couple of shy of 1,500 people in attendance. Um, you know, it's a lot of hard work. Not only did I main event the event, uh, but I also, you know, co-promoted it with my dad. And, you know, it was a long 10 months build up to make sure that, you know, we delivered. Fightmare has always been, you know, our marquee show. Um, you know, Fightmare 3 was at Carroll Road, 5,000 fans. You know, we absolutely smashed out of the park there. Fightmare 2, 1,000 fans at the Waveney Sports Centre. Uh, and Fightmare 1 uh, in 2001 was at the Sports Village in Norwich. And we got 2,000 at a time where wrestling was really on its backside, John. Yeah. You know, we're getting 30 fans if we were lucky. Um, at this time, they were bringing tribute acts to try and get fans back through the door. But my dad, you know, he'd done a, camp uh, he'd done a huge campaign for all the media saying British wrestling's still alive, drew 2,000 fans and WAW really bombed forward then. But, you know, Fightmare 4 for me was a dream come true. Um, you know, Roy has and always will be one of my heroes in professional wrestling. I don't think there's anyone that move around the ring to this day or probably ever in this industry that move as fast as him, bumps around, gets this business, has that intensity, bring that big fight feel to every match. You know, he's a man that really is good at everything that he do. Um, and he's got some great say, shape himself as well, Zach. He's, he's got in some phenomenal shape as well. We need to give him a huge shout out. You know, he, he's not shy about it. He's putting on his social. The man is really fought back from his demons. Next Friday, he'll be 100 days dry of alcohol. That is the longest that my brother has been in 20 years. Um, I'm proud of my brother and I know how proud he is of me. You know, let's not beat around the bush and try and, you know, pull the wool over the fans' eyes. My brother said to me about Fightmare 4, 
I believe it's your time, bro. You need to take these titles. People need to see that, you know, you're the man, basically. Um, you know, and he's done that for RKJ in 2019 at Fight Mare 3 in front of 5,000 people. Yeah. He then done it for me this year. You know, he's so selfless when it comes to wrestling. Um, and again, this, this might be my very best match. I thoroughly enjoyed it. The story we told was phenomenal. We had the fans on the edge of their seats and stood up for the majority of the match. It really delved into the, all the styles of wrestling, traditional British wrestling, Mexican wrestling, American wrestling, a nice story-based wrestling. You know, then we dipped into this, this death match style that is sort of coming into fashion, as we all know. Um, you know, there's tables, chairs, you name it. We, we, we left the piece of each other in that ring that night and I'll forever be grateful for what my brother done for me and what what our sister done for us because she really put eyes on that match. You know, Soraya being there, people are intrigued to see what she's going to be doing. Um, you know, so her just coming into the match, put eyes on us. Um, you know, she done a fantastic job. There's some pictures on social media of my brother throwing me off the top rope for a table. And if you zoom in, the emotion and the whole story is in Soraya's face. And that one picture is kind of like, my brothers are going to kill each other if I don't stop this, but I have to stay neutral. I can't defend Zach. I can't defend Roy. Um, it was it was phenomenal. It, honestly, it will live with me forever, John. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let's <clears throat> let's rewind a little bit and uh, go all the way back because I know your dad, Ricky Knight Senior, and your your mum, Sweet Soraya. Uh, yeah. Your dad's been in the business thirty five years. Your mum, thirty two. Let's bring up a couple of pictures here. There he uh, is. He's a good looking chap, and he eh? He is um, indeed. Look. And the beautiful Sweet Soraya there. Um, but uh, now you're thirty one years old. Is that right, Zach? That's correct. Yeah. So, so you you was born into the business um, and uh, grew up in the business. What what's what's it like, kind of as a youngster growing up? In that environment, with your, your dad a pro wrestler, your mum a pro wrestler, um, it, it must have been an interesting time, to say the least. You know, it's kind of bittersweet. A, a lot of people will ask me this question, and the first thing I'll say to them is, I know no different. That was my life. So to me, it's normal, you know. But it had the good and it had the bad, you know. Um, it was good. We see the entire UK before we'd reached double figures, you know. Every nook and cranny we, we'd seen, um, you know, we'd met. Some of our childhood heroes at a young age, you know, like I said, when they were bringing a lot of the Americans over, Earthquake and Yokozuna and Greg the Hammer Valentine and the Bushwhackers and Jake the Snake Roberts and you name it. I was meeting these people, sat backstage, listening to their stories, picking their brains and learning the business. So I loved it. But then you got the flip side where, you know, people label you as, you know, carnies or travelers or, you know, or your mum and dad are away, you know, you're on your own and, it's difficult. It really is. You know, if they picked up one injury, um, you know, and they're sat on, on the sofa for a month, they're not earning money, yeah. you know? So you don't get any money in professional wrestling for being injured. You know, there's no sick pay. There's, there's no holiday pay. There's nothing. So, you know, mum and dad were at the top of the top of the tree in the UK wrestling. But if one got injured or if there was a problem or, you know, the car broke down and they couldn't get to the shows for the week, then we'd be stuck. It'd be mashed potato sandwiches or fish finger sandwiches, like just to fill your little tummies up. You know, I'm very appreciative of everything that my mum and dad give me because they went above and beyond to give us children what we needed in life. Um, and that, that, you know, that's not money or anything like that. They taught us how to love, respect, um, you know, that they taught us so many crucial things that would get us through life. You know, family is everything, you know, um, they really try and keep us family as close knit as possible. You know, we're, we're all for each other. Uh, you know, Christmas is always fantastic. That's one time a year where we all really make the effort to come together and, uh, you know, show each other that we appreciate one another and we love each other. Um, but like I said, you know, there, there were down times trying to go through school. You know, um, I, I made my debut at 10 years old. So high school, out of the four years that I was meant to do, I think I'd probably done about a year tops. And that, that's in and out uh, of school because I'm being booked elsewhere. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't enough to do with my parents. I would go in and deliberately get excluded because I know if I got excluded for four weeks, I get four weeks worth of work and I'm living on the road. I'm an adult, you know. Um, so it was difficult. It was difficult. But at the same time, I wouldn't swap a single minute of yeah. my life um, yeah. because it's maybe the person I am. 
uh, and the knowledge that I received living on the road, growing up with world of sport legends and former WWE legends, you know, they're all legends in today's world as well. You, you can't pay for that knowledge. There's no seminar that can teach people the, the wealth that I got growing up. So, you know, I'm blessed. Absolutely. I'm going to flash up another picture here. Now, uh... Who, who's this guy here, eh? Who's this guy? Um, and uh, this was obviously, you, I think a lot of the, the the knights start off in a mask, especially because they start so young. I know RKJ said exactly the same thing. It's probably the same for, for PJ and, uh, and others, uh, including yourself. Uh, but to, to tell us a bit about this character here. Who, what name did you go by at the time when you, when you, when you first broke in under the mask? Um, so funny enough, um, that wasn't my first gimmick. Oh, <laughs> But so I started off in a blue Power Ranger outfit. I was six years old and I was going out as a mascot for the baby face on the holiday camps. Uh, and everyone thought I was a person of restricted growth. Right. So I'm going out there and I'm I'm camping up, clapping my hands, getting the crowd into it. And I'd get three spots during the match. Uh, that would be the, the Bronco in the corner. That would be the peekaboo where the villain would chase me around. And then the baby face would jump back behind uh, the corner and clothesline him. And then the final part was when the baby face got the victory, they would jump out, high five all the fans. And I'd be in the middle of the ring going, nah, 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 you lost, you lost. And my dad would body slam me and leg drop me. And you'd hear a pin drop. Absolute silence. I'd be carried out, be brought backstage, and I would sell it for half hour, 40 minutes to all the fun stars and blue coats. And, you know, the mask would always stay on. My dad said he's a, he's a, he's a lad from Mexico. He's coming over here for experience. You know, he's, I know it's probably the wrong terminology nowadays, but I was deemed as a midget then, yeah. right? Uh, because I was so young. Uh, then I went in to become Dink the Clown. Uh, obviously, Doink was very uh, sought after. Once he was on WWE, everyone started doing clown gimmicks. And uh, I was Dink. I was his little mascot. And, um, you know, that's when I made my debut. I'd start doing... Uh, three on two tag matches, and I was the extra man in the match that would go in and maybe pull a head scissors or a hurricane runner, or you know, they'd throw me off the top rope and a dive across, or you know, I'd never take the heat, I was too young. Uh, but they'd have me knocked out within five minutes of the match with a leg drop off the top or whatever. Um, then I got to 13, and my dad said to me, Right, now we've got to find Zach, we need to work out who you're going to be because this is going to be your gimmick moving forward. You know, um, I found the hysteria mask, which I fell in love with. Mum modified it so I didn't get done for copyright. <laughs> um, and dad just looked at me and he went, I've got your name. I went, what is it? He went, Zach Zodiac. And everyone in the house, everyone just went, wicked. We love that. You know, the ZZ, like the logo's there. Like, yes, Zach Zodiac, let's go. So from 13 to 19, I was Zach Zodiac under the mask. Uh, and my job was just to be the real life superheroes to kids. You know, there was Absolutely. no real gimmick there. It was just, you're a teenager in a mask, making sure these kids have a great time. Uh, and I want you to fly around the ring as much as you can with high risk maneuvers uh, and entertain these fans. And that's what I'd done for sort of the first, you know, seven or eight years of breaking into the business really was just, you know, on first, open them up hot and make sure they they knew what was coming for the rest of the show. Absolutely. And, and tell us a bit about the holiday camps, because I know WAW has done a lot of business over the years, um, entertaining the fans at the holiday camps uh, on the East Coast and probably further afield. Uh, but when did you start doing the holiday camps? And I know I've spoken to dozens of wrestlers on this show, Zach, um, and they absolutely swear that the holiday camps is a real is a making of a pro wrestler. You can grind, you can cut your teeth. Um, and uh, like I say, you do uh, like I say, three or four shows a day. You know, yep. six weeks in the summer season um, and really, really learn your craft. But uh, tell us a bit about your experience of doing the holiday camps, especially as a, as, a, as a lad growing up and learning the ropes in the business. So I was actually 12 years old when I done my first holiday camp. It was uh, Blackpool Pontons, which isn't there anymore. Uh, but we were doing the Pontons run uh, and I'd either wrestle my dad or Roy. Uh, you know, they were the two that I was always against. It was the same match. You know, uh, again, I'd get my ass kicked, maybe two or three comebacks throughout the whole match, um, you know, and th they'd put me over with a roll up or a dive across off the top rope just so that I could sell the masks or foam hands or whatever. Um, but the holiday camps are a real learning curve. One, you're getting multiple reps a week. You know, um, 
when I was when I started, we were doing roughly about 15 shows a week, roughly. Um, you know, so sometimes that would be three or four in a day. Uh, you'd always have a, a Monday and a Friday off day with the office days. The rest of the days, you know, you're two, three, four in a day, as well as hall shows if uh, if you could make it. Uh, but the real factor about the holiday camps is, you know, you've got anything from 200 to 3,000 holiday makers. Wrestling is free entertainment. The holiday camp is paying you to entertain these holiday makers. Now, if you can get these people invested in a story on the holiday camps who ain't wrestling fans, think what you can do to wrestling fans. Yeah. So the holiday camps is where, that's your bread and butter. You know, I'm so thankful <clears throat> that I've had 19 consecutive years on the holiday camps, perfecting my craft, trying new stuff. If it goes wrong, it don't matter because they don't know it's part of the show. You know, this is where I can learn to be good guy, bad guy, you know, um, telling the story. If I'm on with, say, Roy at a big show, give me six weeks on the camps to make sure we've got the best match possible. You know, the fans will tell us if it's good or not. Um, you know, promos, you know, promos on the holiday camps help me so much because, you know, you need to get a promo that's going to rally these people up and get them to hate you when they don't even know you. It's free entertainment. So if I could do it to a casual person that is there just to sit there and take the mick out of professional wrestling, I know I can get a fan rallied up. So, you know, I urge any young talent that is uh, trying to perfect their craft and sort of move forward in this industry, get at least three, four years of holiday camps under your belt, you know, because two, three years on the camps, you're looking at 200 matches minimum. And, and there's some people that's been in the business 10 years that still haven't even done 200 matches. Um, you know, I, I think at 10 years old, I managed to get 76 matches, you know, so. Uh, that's incredible. <clears throat> yeah. yeah that's incredible. You know, and, and then all wrestling, you know, that, that would be a, a manager spot or like I said, a three on two or, you know, sometimes I'd get a singles match. I remember wrestling my mum at uh, the Princess Theatre in Clacton. Uh, I was about 11, 12 years old. And dad was like, you're going to have to do a single. Someone's pulled out. And we went in and wrestled British technical wrestling, you know, a woman and, and, and a lad in a mask uh, build again as a midget. Um, and we went in there and we, we tore it up. It was, it was fantastic, but it's because the camps enabled me to understand the concept and we got to work a week on the camps and then boom, I'm in the match. Absolutely. And uh, I want to take a deep dive into your, your wrestling style and your philosophies a little bit later on. But a few people that have got in touch. <clears throat> um, Jack Knight watching via YouTube. Zach is very talented. Uh, you're telling us something that we already know there. Also via YouTube, uh, Paul uh, Greenberg. Uh, Zach is a British wrestling legend, of course. And uh, once again, Paul Roy versus Zach for me is up there for match of the year. Absolutely. Uh, we've got also watching via YouTube, the Green Funko King reviews on Cool Toys. That's a long YouTube name. Uh, love seeing how confident Zach has got and now he believes. Uh, we all believe, of course. Um, and we've got also uh, Marco Cardara. Um, hi, Zach. I'm Spencer from Italy. So I don't know if you know Italy, uh, Spencer from Italy, but hi, uh, Marco or Spencer. But uh, thank you so much for watching. And you have come forward with some questions. Um, let's bring one of, one of them up now just for a bit of fun. But um, Paul watching via YouTube again. Question for Zach. Any dream opponents that you haven't faced yet? So I know that this year you've ticked a lot of top talent off of your bucket list like uh, Okada and Ishii for example being uh, two of those but uh, any more top talents top names that you'd like to get in there with um it's a bit of a, a dream bucket list scenario um I think if I have a dream match um to be honest with you it would probably be Daniel Bryan and the reason I say that <sighs> is you know Daniel is what I define as an all-round wrestler you know the guy can tech he can fly you know uh, his selling's impeccable. Uh, you know, he's believable. He can go in there with a seven-foot giant and, and make it look like he's got a chance to win the match. This is a man that has really perfected his craft uh, and I believe one of the best all-round workers out there. And I just think that our styles coming together would be one hell of a story and one hell of a ride. So, you know, I know that he's on about slowing down once his contract finished a little bit with AEW. That's circulated on the uh, on the dirt sheets. Um but I hope and pray that I get there before he slows down just so I could tick that one off my list. 
Yeah, I'm sure I've heard a story, and I don't know, I don't know if it was on a, a Daniel Bryan podcast or when he was uh, interviewed, but uh, that he's actually been over to the UK and wrestled for your dad uh, a long time ago. Do you remember? That's, that's true. So he come over for us and he wrestled at um, the Great Yarmouth Atlantis Arena. Um, yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't work for the same money he did back then now. Um, <laughs> if he did, I'd book him for the next 10 years. But um, yeah, I, I mean, Daniel Bryan, you know, we met him. He come over. He wrestled on the Butlins camps. Uh, I never got the pleasure of getting in the ring with uh, with Brian, uh, but I was on tour with him. Uh, lovely guy to this day. You know, it's still a nod of the head as a, a sign of, I remember, you know, um, he, he's just such a lovely, lovely man. Um, and like I said, I'm praying. It, funny enough, one of the stories that always circulate is when <laughs> Brian come over for All-Star Wrestling, he's walked into the dressing room and my dad and brother are hanging someone out of a, a ninth story window. Um, and Brian's kind of walked in and gone, well, yeah, I, I'm walking out. <laughs> and, you know, I remember dad saying to me after that, we went to find him and introduced ourselves and said, welcome to Paul kid. And, you know, and, and Brian puts that in his book and says that story all the time. So I'm not that's saying That's where it, I heard it. Like, yeah, that's where I heard it. Fantastic story. Uh, now, I want to bring up this picture here. The UK hooligans. Um, I think they, they were originally named as the, the football hooligans, I believe, and then the hooligans, yep. and then the UK hooligans. But yourself and Roy there, we've spoken about Roy. What a fantastic character, what a fantastic professional wrestler he is, and a legend of the UK circuit. But that tag team with yourself and Roy, I think it started probably 2010 or thereabouts, maybe a little bit sooner, but it's continued all the way through. And I think you've had matches this year, as a matter of fact, 12 years on. Uh, but you two are renowned for probably being the best act, the best, uh, one of the best tag team acts in UK wrestling history because of its longevity, because of the success that you've had, and because of, you know, the, the, the style of your team, the characters involved. Tell us a bit about teaming with Roy, especially as the hooligans, um, and what a fantastic success that tag team's been. Yeah, I mean, obviously growing up, you know, my, my dad's always been, you know, one of my heroes, um, but, you know, when I really started breaking onto the scene at sort of 19, 20 ish, you know, Roy was the man around town. You know, he was working for like FWA flying to America. The first night family member to fly to America was Roy. That's for XPW wrestling, Jerry Lynn, um, uh, Mercury and Johnny storm in a four way. Um, so this is a true story. Uh, it's actually started um, in 2011, the hooligans did. And the reason being is I'd just done my uh, three-on-one handicap match with the big show. And prior to that match, I was pretty much told, you're signed. You know, I give myself a really good account in the in the tryout stages, the matches that they were doing. I'd done a really good promo. Uh, my agent basically said, you're in, you're in type thing. Done that match and Tom LaRuffa and... Um, Andy Baker, I think it was, both of them got signed after that match. And I didn't. Um, and that really was the straw that broke the camel's back. That destroyed me. You know, I was 20 years old. I'd been touring with TNA for two, three years. You know, I then went on and this was like my third or fourth tryout for the WWE. I'd done everything that they had asked of me, got in shape, you know, trim down, put weight on, you know, work on your promo, do this, do that. I'd done everything that was asked of me. And that really destroyed me. So Roy said to me, I remember him, it was around uh, sort of Christmas time. He said to me, bro, I've had my single career. I've done this for the last 17 years. Let's tag together. Let's show people what you're really about. Let's get our names out there, you know, and we didn't really put a time scale on it. Roy just wanted to help me get over this horrible stage in my life and remember why I fell in love with wrestling in the first place and not put so much pressure on myself. So, you know, we started off as the football hooligans coming out with beers and white vests and cut down jeans. Um, and over time, that transitioned to the UK hooligans to be a bit more family friendly, you know, uh, with the holiday camps and, you know, all star wrestling, who we we done a lot of shows for. Um, and it was the act that we could dial up. We didn't, you know, we could invest more in our wrestling gear and tone that bit down, but just yeah. vamp up the, the act as and when we need to for the indie crowds. Um that was probably one of the biggest learning experiences of my whole career was work on my brother. He's very quiet. He's very reserved. Um, and believe it or not, he's actually quite shy. 
So that meant that I had to be the ones to talk to the promoters. I had to be the ones taking the bookings. I had to be the one to deal with the money, you know, and he would always push that to me. He's like, no, bro, you handle it. And, you know, he'd teach me etiquette backstage. He would, you know, if he thought someone was taking liberties with me in the ring, you know, he'd give me one chance to start fighting back myself before he come with a ring bell or a chair and, you know, would jump on and be like, yo, that's my brother. Don't take the piss. Sorry yeah. if I'm not like to swear. No, but please carry on. You know, so he he really did take me under his wing. And, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I had to have that hard conversation with my brother saying, look, you know, and, and he, he was all for it. You know, he understood that he's 10 years older than me. And, you know, he, he has a, he got a criminal record and there's so many factors that were holding him back. And I want to quickly say that, you know, had Roy had dealt with his demons sooner, um, at, you know, which wouldn't have got him in trouble, he would have been yeah. signed. Make yeah. no mistake about it. We've heard it from the horse's mouth. He's that gifted. He would have been the first night signed. Trust us. But the problem is he had, a, you know, an awful start to life, um, you know, which he's open and honest about. You can read his book, buy that on Amazon, etc. cetera. Um, so we had that horrible conversation of, I need to go on my own, bro. You know, I, I really want to give it one last chance. Like, you've taught me everything that you've, that you know. You've, You've built me back up. You give me self-belief. You know, you've made me realize that I am good. I could go on with anyone, you know, but now I need to do that on my own because I haven't quite had the singles career that you had. And I want to make sure that, you know, I, I don't ignore that so that I don't get too old that I can't fulfill the dream. Yeah. Um, and as a true hero and brother, it's kind of like, go, go. We'll still be the hooligans. We'll still tag as and when we can. But, you know, he supports me and, that's one thing that I can, you know, never duplicate is the, the faith and love that he's shown in me to say, go, bro. You know, uh, a lot of people would have probably been like, shit, we've invested 10 years of a tag yeah. team. Like, you know, let's go together. But there were so many factors that couldn't let us go together. Uh, even when we thought it was going to happen, it never really did sort of come to fruition. So in the end, it had to be, OK, let me see if I can do this. But I don't want to completely leave you. So the hooligans are still there. But I know I've got the blessing and support of my big bro that is rooting for me and will let me know often enough that, you know, I'm doing a good job. 100%. And uh, what an inspirational uh, figure your, your brother is. Uh, but, but the hooligans, for my money, um, like I said, they've been a staple of the UK wrestling scene for many, many years. And uh, we'll go down in uh, in folklore for what they've done for the UK wrestling tag team scene. But uh, a few of the people that have got in touch. Uh, Pete, again, thank you for watching via YouTube. Uh, Zach versus Daniel Bryan, take my money now. 100%. Absolutely. Um, We've got uh, Burnlock Acoustics watching via YouTube, so thank you. Uh, Favourite match of yours that people may never have seen? Um, also, which UK talent would you like to work with and uh, that you have not yet had the chance to? So is there like a, um, a, a match out there that's locked away in a vault somewhere that people may never have seen? Or maybe a, a top match of yours that's maybe not as well known? Have you got a, a favourite match out there that people might not have tuned into yet or come across? Yeah, so um, funny enough, it's a guy called uh, Isaac Rain. Um, he was from Norway, uh, and he basically become like a foster brother of mine. You know, he'd uh, he'd actually went home to tell his parents uh, that he was moving to England to move in with us and pursue his career as a professional wrestler. Sadly, Isaac passed away in two thousand and seven, um, but August two thousand and six, me and him wrestled at the Marina Centre in Great Yarmouth. And we blew the absolute roof off. You know, Isaac was such a phenomenal worker. Um, you know, any matches that I have with Isaac Rain or a guy called Aaron Frost um, that are on YouTube, I urge people to watch it because, you know, we were we were coming up with some fantastic stuff and we were moving around that ring so well, um, you know, and both of them are, are talents that unfortunately one's passed away, the other one is retired from wrestling, but... They're two people that could have definitely made the, the big leagues. Um, and, you know, regarding working uh, UK talent, yeah. I think if there's anyone left on my list that I have to work, it's Will Ospreay. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that that's not happened. I'm, I'm well, stunned has, that that's not happened. It has as a tag team. We've done it oh. in PCW. I remember actually um, Will was uh, done this flip over the top rope. I really hope Flood has got this uh, footage. That'd be brilliant. But 
he basically was doing this flip over the top rope and we were meant to go down with him, right? But yeah. instead, as he's flipped, I caught him in a powerbomb position and I was like, this is too good to go down now. So I just, <laughs> I just give him the powerbomb on the side of the ring, you know? Uh, but I'd love to see that footage because it was meant to just be uh, everyone down, you know, will up, big pop. But I remember catching him and just being like, I can't believe I just don't right, have it. You know, I'm on top now. Um, so yeah, I'd really love to work him in a singles, even more so now. Um, you know, obviously he's been in Japan a long time and in Japan, they really perfect your craft of professional wrestling. Will's now not just that high risk maneuver guy. You know, his all round game is really shaped up. His storytelling, his strikes, his, his technical ability, his presence, his aura, like just everything about it you know, gives me chills. And I know that with my mind and his mind, we'd create magic. So hopefully that happens before one of us retires. Hey, but, uh, you know, uh, Rev Pro is, is Will Ospreay's home as well. And now that you're a regular there, um, let's make that happen. But uh, I want to talk to you about fighting with my family now. And I'm not necessarily on about the motion picture, but I'm on about the documentary uh, because the documentary came first, of course. But um, <clears throat> rewinded a little bit. I don't think that was the first documentary you were featured on, was it? Was there one a little bit earlier, a few years earlier, uh, that featured yourself as an even younger Zach Zodiac? Yeah, so actually, prior to Fighting My Family 2012, yeah. um, we had done 15 different documentaries. Oh, wow, there's, I didn't realise. There's archive footage that I really don't want leaked of, like, cameras <laughs> in there while me and Soraya are in a bubble bath together. You know, you can't see yeah. nothing. And in today's world, that definitely wouldn't be aired on TV. Yeah. But, you know, what would it be? Maybe 25 years ago, it wow. was aired, you know? Yeah. Um so there's that, that we, we done so many documentaries and a, a funny story fight on my family. The documentary was meant to be about my dad. Oh, wow. um, it was, it was a, a wrestling fan. He was, his name is Max Fisher. Uh, and he was a huge wrestling fan. And he, he remember watching my dad as a super flies when he was younger at the corn exchange. And he basically had been given a budget to go out there and do a, a documentary on wrestling. And he phoned my dad and was like, I want to come to you. Now, again, this is where people need to give my dad kudos for this, because at that time, once we started filming, we got a phone call from Drew McDonald saying, Rick, WWE wants to give Soraya and Zach a tryout. Let's, you know, we, we need to do this. And as they've done that, dad's on the phone. He's like, right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. Yeah. OK. They'll be there. They'll be there. No problem. So he hang up the phone and he's bellowed at the top of his uh, deep, rough voice. Zach, Soraya. We come downstairs. The camera's rolling. And he says, uh, WWE's just phoned. Uh, no, Drew McDonald from WWE's just phoned. You've got a tryout in April, both of you. Zach, get in the garden and get your training done. Soraya, go get something pretty to wear. And then he looked at Max Fisher and Max was like, whoa, like, did this just happen? I've got this on film? Like, you're telling me that within three months, they're going to be at WWE? Like, so dad, God bless him, literally went, there's your story, Max. Yeah. That's your story. You need to follow these. They're both going to get signed. I know they are because they're the best, you know, and, and very selfishly just went, nah, make it about these, you know, uh, and obviously that led on to God knows how many things, but it well, was one, it. one tiny selfless act from dad helped yeah. helped us dramatically but but that documentary it, it was kind of like the start of uh, not just a new page but a new chapter a new book for for the whole family wasn't it Be because it did open up you know this world of wwe to our very eyes and, and obviously it documented yourself and soraya um the, the tryout and everything that happened and the aftermath and obviously soraya flying off to florida and what yeah. happened around that time. Um, so, I mean, it, it really is phenomenal. That, and like I say, fortuitous timing um, that, that that it all coincided with that phone call as well. Really, really yeah. fortuitous. And, and like I say, the Fighting With My Family documentary is a piece of history as far as I'm concerned because it tells so many stories in that 45 minutes or an hour, however long it is. It's truly fantastic. And it opened my eyes to you guys and to what was going on. And obviously, Soraya flying off to Florida, becoming Paige. Um, and then, of course, a few years down the line, 
Um, you've got a certain Dwayne the Rock Johnson scene in a hotel room somewhere in London uh, filming, I think it's a Fast and Furious uh, franchise yeah. somewhere in London, seen in his hotel room. He caught a glimpse of Fighting With My Family, the documentary. Immediately, he got on the phone to Stephen Merchant um, from The Office and the famed director. Uh, very tall, very, very tall. Um, yeah. And uh, and then before you knew it, you, you guys were kind of... <laughs> By the way, uh, we're going to make a, a film of your your life, of your family, and uh, fighting with my family, the motion picture. When you first heard that this was in the works or a possible idea involving The Rock and Stephen Merchant, could you believe what was happening? Absolutely not. And in professional wrestling, you, you promise the earth all the time and nothing ever comes, you know. So we were brought up to say, look, when you're sat on the plane or when the contract's in your hand or when you're in the ring in the building, like... That's when you get excited. Don't believe in, you know, what people promise you because it, it's not going to happen. And, you know, if you build your hopes up, you're setting yourself for a fall. Um, you know, so that's one thing I'll credit my mum and dad for again. You know, they, they taught us real life stuff that, you know, you need it, these qualities in order to, to get through life half the time. Um, but no, I never expected in my wildest dreams and you know, we got the phone call and it still took about another two years after the phone call for it to start mm -hmm. going into production wow. and everything else. So even then you're going, oh, this is BS. This ain't going to happen. Why would they Why would they do a Hollywood movie about our family? That doesn't make no sense. You've got Hulk Hogan there. You've, you've got The Rock himself. You've got Stone Cold. Like, why would they pick us? That don't make no sense. And then as soon as we started getting the phone calls from Stephen Merchant, you know, um, First things first, I want to come to one of your shows. And when the show finished, I want to come back to your house. I'm going to come back to your house. I want to speak to all of you individually and pick your brains about what you know, you know, what you've seen, what you've done, what you want to tell me. And all of us were as open as we could be. You know, um, the movie itself, you know, it done fantastic. There's parts of it that I'm not happy with, uh, truthfully. Um, you know, obviously, this was in an era, a time frame where my brother was meant to be on holiday in a certain place, you know, yeah. but the, the time frame is all messed up in places, um, you know, and they showcased me as someone that would, you know, of, was a fighter and a drinker. And that that's never really been the case. You know, I've never really been a, a huge social person, if I'm honest, yeah. um, you know, uh, drinking, with the problems that my brother and my dad have openly admitted and had, it's never been something that I've been overly keen on. Um, you know, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I, I lived, you know, from a, an early teenager through to maybe my twenties, I was a drinker. That's something that I would do. Um, yeah. But with drink comes trouble and, you know, nine out of 10, that leads to drugs. And the other flip side to me was gambling. As soon as I had a drink, I felt like I was the luckiest man in the world. And, you know, so for me, I put all that to a side and, when they were showcasing the violence and the drinking, I felt like that maybe hindered me for a long time. Uh, you know, people are then like, well, is he a drinker? Is he a thug? Is he violent? Does he go to pubs and start fights? And the mm. answer to all that is no. You know, I'd never get in the ring and beat the crap out of my sister. And, you know, yeah. there's a couple of bits where you're sitting there thinking, oh, I don't like the way I've been portrayed here. But as a, a full circle story, I love the way that it finished. I love the way that they... They had me with my children, looking at my sister, showing how proud I was. It was kind of then duplicated at AEW all these years later, 10 yeah. years or whatever later, me stood there watching her going, now this is the real Zach. You know, I would do anything for her. I'm proud of her. You know, I, I wish her nothing but success, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, 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 did you have any any creative input? Did as a family, did you have any creative input into the film? Because I know that you were in the film very briefly. We saw you uh, there, um, and uh, but but did they kind of ask for any uh, clarity before they shot any scenes from any of the any family members about how things went in real life? Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, actually, they were very open. They were open armed about a lot of stuff. You know, my mum and dad sort of not put their foot down, but they said, look, you know, we want Norwich to be in this, you know, we're very proud of where we come from. You know, we want people to know that we live in Norwich and, you know, there is a wrestling company in Norwich and, you know, we're grinding at a lower level to what you are, but we're still doing the same thing. So they were very open about that. They were very adamant that they wanted, you know, Roy to be seen in this as well. Um, you know, uh, they didn't give us any say on who we wanted to play us. 
Um, but I feel like they've done a, a pretty incredible job uh, with the cast of characters that they got. When you think about Lena Headey just coming off Game of Thrones and and Nick yeah. Frost, who absolutely smashed the role as my dad. And, you know, yeah. Florence Pugh, who's gone on to be an absolute mega star, the same as Jack Loudon, you know, um, everyone that they, they put in that movie just seemed to slot in. It was just so well done. They really did get the crew in, uh, right. And they brought us on to set. Wow, you can see how much weight I've lost there. Um, you can, they invited us on to set. We we had a, a small hand in, in training these people uh, before they went to NXT UK. Um, you know, our wrestling ring was the ones that they were using when they were over here. So there was just a little warehouse or an industrial estate that we drove our ring, dumped it in there for a week. You know, uh, like I said, small part in showing them uh, the wrestling. They did have another UK guy on site for the training as well. Um, so yeah, you know, but yeah. you, you, we also have to be very careful that we're not coming across to like, don't you do this? You know, uh, I remember the first time I see the movie was October, 2017, pretty much the, the time frame where I was in my lowest stage of my life. Um, and that really was the first thing that kickstarted my drive to go again. Yeah. was the way that Stephen Merchant highlighted some of what I do. You know, you never can see what you do through your eyes. You can't see that. You know, you don't know how you're depicted to other people. But on the movie, I was given a little bit of an insight to how and what I do. Working with James, I took that for granted. Training a blind guy, you know, and today that's probably one of my biggest accolades that people always pat me on the back for. But prior to 2017, when I first see the movie, the first cut, I was a bit like, so what? I'm training a guy. He wants to wrestle. What, yeah. what's, what's the big deal? You know, or the, what I do with the kids or everything else. Like when that was highlighted, it was kind of like, right, I've done so much for others now. Now I need to give myself the same belief, the same talks that I give to these people that you could do anything you set your mind to, do it to yourself. And that was the real start of the clawback. And then the pandemic come in and that was a chance for me to get in shape. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and uh, uh, I've got an interesting story in relation to fighting with my family. Uh, I interviewed Big F in Joe. Uh, I think it was early twenty twenty, um, and he told me during that interview that not only did he have a part in the film uh, in the tryout scene, but yeah. ironically, he was also part of the same tryout that you and Soraya was at in twenty twelve. Um, so he kind of played himself in the movie, so to speak. Uh, he also said that he was um, asked to be security uh, on the doors for the premiere of the film as well in Norwich. So yeah. uh, but Big F and Joe has kind of got a little bit of a tie into this. So a well, shout out to Joe. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned that because that was another thing that my my mum and dad were quite hot on. It was like, well, if you need extras, use our wrestlers. Yeah. You know, we all want them to have a part and a shine in this as well. So um you know, I know lots of the UK guys got a chance to to be involved in this movie. And what people don't realize, it was mum and dad that actually said that, you know. Um, and it wasn't specifically just WAW guys. It was, if it's a wrestler movie, you've got to cast wrestlers as the extras. It's as simple as that. They want yeah. to put money in the indie boy's pocket. And they don't get credited for that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Sam J, if you're watching, I will get to your question very soon. Please don't worry. Um, right. So let's see where we are. Let's see where we are. So I, I want to talk to you about now, April this year, I saw you in Westbury, Wiltshire, my hometown, for Immortal Wrestling at the Venom Nightclub. Um, and uh, you had a, a fantastic four-way match with three other members of your family. There was yourself, there was RKJ, PJ and Tony Knight, of course. I'll get to the match in a minute. But before we open the doors to the public, you did a training seminar. Now, one th now I sat there and watched every minute of it. I wasn't part of the training seminar. I've never taken a bump in my life. Don't intend to either. Uh, but I watched the training seminar. And one thing that really struck me was your, your love and your passion for, for pro wrestling, but for British wrestling. And you, you, you were adamant and very passionate that the trainees – nowadays in general aren't trained traditional British wrestling in terms of lockups and how to get out of holds, positioning of feet, how to hit the ropes. And you were very, very passionate about the standard sack. 
Um, yeah. And that really, really struck a chord with me. Um, and obviously, you're one of the trainers at the WAW Performance Center as well. And you've already spoken about, you know, traditional, having a deep love for traditional British wrestling. Tell us a bit about them, them passions and, you know, having such a love for the detail of the sport. Well, look, I'm not being funny, but, you know, these that style is what paved the way for professional wrestling in general. You know, the Greco-Roman, the freestyle, the amateur, you know, um, basics are the most important part of any job. You know, if you skip your basics, your foundations ain't there. You know, running the ropes properly. Um, you know, I'm probably going to get heat for this, but one of my pet peeves is when people run with their leg up on the rope. You know, I'm not being funny. What if I follow in with a clothesline or what if I go for a sleep or if your legs up in the air, it's not safe. How are you looking after your opponent? You know, uh, when you're bumping, I try and make sure that they're, they're lifting their tailbones up, their chins on their chest. They take the impact through the palms of their hands. You know, your feet are on the floor and not up in the air. Same principle. If I give someone a clothesline, they're bumping on top of their shoulders. They're going to toe pump me in my kidney or something. You know, they're, they're my vital organs, man. So. I'm very, very tough on basics of professional wrestling. You know, the rest comes with experience. But, you know, go into a boxing gym, they'll make you do, you know, um, uh, literally jab, jab, punch. So they'll say left, left, right, left, left, right, on the bag every time for an hour. Do you know what I mean? Or skip, go and skip, you know, 10 rounds of three minutes skipping. That's all you're doing today. Why? So that you're nimble on your feet. You know, but... Too many people now are like, okay, I could do a back bump. So if I could do a back bump, I could do a suplex. And if I could do a suplex, then I could do a suplex off the top rope. And if I could land on my back off the top rope, then surely I could do a 450. And if I could do a 450, then I'll try a shoot and start to the outside. Like, it, you, you've got to make sure your basics and your foundations are there. The old saying, you can't run before you can walk, is so true in professional wrestling. You know, a good wrestler... You know, it takes years, years upon years to, to learn this industry and to perfect your craft. And, you know, a lot of the basics are being lost along the ways. You know, you look at wrestlers nowadays, we were taught to hit the post so the ring moved, you know, and most yeah. people now they'll run, hop, skip and jump into the post or, you know, they're running across the ring and the legs are in the air or they're bumping on the top of their necks or, you know, that they're, they're doing a flip bump off two feet. You know, well, I'm not being funny. Think about the moves that you're taking. You should be posting off one foot, you know, head up in the air. Don't look down because gravity take their place. There's so many small factors that can really improve your game. And if your basics are right, you look like a textbook wrestler. Yeah. You know, don't worry about popping the boys backstage. Worry about making the fans believe that you are legit and a pro at what you do. And that is what I aspire to be. My, my whole thing that I'm doing in this lifetime in professional wrestling is when I go, I want to be graced as one of the greats. You know, I, I don't want to be the greatest of all time. I don't want to be even the number one wrestler in the world. All I want people to say was Zach loved this business. He knew this business. He studied this business. And my God, did he know how to put on matches? If I can leave that legacy, I've done enough. And I'm trying to plant these seeds through my training. Absolutely. It's all about the fundamentals, all about the basics. And then uh, we were graced with this amazing four-way match um, at Immortal Wrestling this past April. Um, and it was for the uh, inaugural King of England Championship. And what a beautiful bout. Yourself, PJ, RKJ and Tony there. Um, but uh, I enjoyed that match because you went all around that nightclub, um, up in the balcony, all around the fans, in and out of the ring. Um, that match looked like a ton of fun. And we're watching it as a spectator. It was a tremendous match. You know, but uh, what were your memories of that match and that evening, my friend? Well, a four way is always difficult. You can't go in there and sort of do locks and holds before you're in there, you know. So, yes, there was some wrestling in there. But, you know, we had to sort of set the seed when you got four men in the ring. You know, you, your job's not to just, you know, concentrate on one. You've got to make sure that all of you are involved at the same time. And if you can't do that, then break away, which is what we've done. You know, we, we've we done our best to make all four members, you know, strong and, and, and doing stuff and this, that and the other. And then you break away and you just get two going, uh, you know. And one thing you probably noticed is, say me and RKJ are, are about to do a high spot. 
Tony and PJ were nowhere to be seen. They'd be on the floor selling or they'd have a double punch and separate so that all eyes were on us so we weren't wasting our bumps. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and vice versa. Um, but it was an incredible match. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, Jay was super lovely. Uh, he was a good guy, easy to work for. Uh, the dressing room, once again, was was you know comfortable, nice and easy. Um, I remember saying to Nick, I was like, look, there's four of us here. This may have come across as being big headed or egotistical, but you know, if this is a four way match, let one of my either you know one of the other two be pinned. They're the least experienced, and at the minute, I'm doing this whole run for this undefeated streak in WAW, which then obviously built up to me and Roy. So I really had to protect a character there, and yeah. you know, I remember you being there and a few people backstage, and you know, that could have come across wrong. Um, but I, Nick Day was, you know, bark on the orders and I was just like, look, dude, you know, there's, he doesn't necessarily need to take the pin on me. If that's what you're about to ask. Yeah. They didn't, but I wanted to make sure we knew straight away that, you know, I, I've, I've got other plans coming up. There's a other bigger other picture. Yeah. And there's a bigger picture, you know, immortal wrestling, uh, you know, is, was a, a growing company, you know, um, it's a growing company. And at that point, I was like, I've got some really big opportunities coming. You know, uh, I need to look at the, the grand scale of things. Exactly, exactly. And uh, uh, Sam J, I'm finally going to get to your question that you sent uh, quite a while ago. Question for Zach. Uh, what is one or two things that you hope to add to your in-ring arsenal in the coming year? Maybe more high flying, maybe more uh, technical moves. Um, I know you spoke earlier about the uh, prize fighter persona, adding some more striking in there, maybe a bit of a boxing influence. But uh, any any thoughts ahead to maybe uh, some other strings you want to add to your bow in 2023, some other things you want to add to your moveset, Zach? So I'm pretty big on judging the crowd. I try and watch every match that is on before and after me so I get a real feel of what the audience are expecting from this show. Um, you know, so I pride myself, you know, that that's my whole catchphrase is an I'm an all-round wrestler. So I'll do whatever is required. But, you know, what I am trying to bring in a little bit more is more combos, like more striking combos. So I'm doing the the, the block, uh, block the elbow, spin an elbow, and then the spinning back, uh, back fist. Um, you know, I'm trying to bring in a lot more combos of my strikes. So it's not just a one and done, you know, it's kind of uh, bringing that real excitement and energy that some of these cruiserweights will bring with their flying. I'm trying to do on my hands, you know, hands, feet, knees. Like, I really want to add that combos where people are like really getting excited about it. But I'm still looking after my body for longevity, you know? 100%, 100%. And a uh, bit of a fun question that came through before we went live today. Um, Undertaker or Sting? Now, I know that you're uh, not just a, a long-time pro wrestler, but you're a massive fan of the sport. Huge fan. And, and you must love these two individuals, Undertaker and Sting. Um, if you have a, a preference, either from a professional standpoint or from a fan standpoint, who would you pick? Listen, I love both these guys, and, you know, they're both – you know, Hall of Famers, they're, they're, they're yeah. incredible talent. They've done so much for this industry. But truthfully, this is a really easy question. I love Sting. I don't think you can ever duplicate The Undertaker. Ever. Ever. Just as soon as that dong went on, the man had you grip just of his entrance. Yeah. Name me someone else that's got that. It, I'll wait because there's no one else that really has that presence on one second of their song the whole fans are ready for him to come out. Man, I'd, I'd love that. You know, so for me, Undertaker's one of the goats. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Let's have a quick look. Uh, Chris Martin, you sent in a question earlier, sent in a second one. If you could wrestle anyone in history, who would you want to wrestle? So uh, past or present? Go on. This is easy for me. There's, there's two. Shawn Michaels or Eddie Guerrero. And if I could pick one more, it would be Kurt Angle. Nice. Them three for me were incredible. And notice again, I've picked three people that are all rounders. They could all fly. They could all tech. They could all shoot. They could all go. They could all strike. They're all charismatic. They're all good promo guys. None of them were afraid to make themselves look silly. You know, they've all been world champ. Yeah. They would be on my, route, my, uh, my Mount Rushmore all day long. 100%. And uh, see, uh, Terry Bartlett uh, watching via YouTube, Undertaker all the way. Uh, like I say, Zach said the very same thing. Um, right. 
Terry also said, love fighting with my family. Like I say, check out the documentary if you haven't already. Uh, I'm also a big fan of the motion picture. Um, and uh, one more question to wrap up. And uh, Chris Martin, once again, final question. What's the best bit of advice that he's, that you've ever been given and who gave it to you? Cool. Ah, it's difficult. You, do you know what? I'm actually going to give a little shout out to someone that, you know, my family are seriously grieving and mourning for at the moment. And that's Len Davis. Len Davis done more for the British wrestling scene than anyone will ever know. And it's definitely gone unnoticed. Production values, you know, uh, Len was one of the first people to bring in the Trons and everything else. But what people don't know is Len's probably been one of my biggest supporters for about 15 years. Um and he used to always say, there's an old saying they, that they say, um, good things come to those that wait. Len didn't have that attitude. Len used to say to me, good things used to come to those that earn it. And to me, that is the best advice I've ever had. Because for many years, I thought I was that good that the opportunity would come to me. And I didn't need to earn it because I'm a Knight family member, or I've been in this business my whole life. And there were so many factors with that chip on your shoulder. As a young boy, remember, you know, I was, I was very young in this business and got granted so much so quickly that at one stage it did go to my head. But now I sit here as a 31-year-old man with three children and a wife with bills to pay, and I'm still no further forward than what I was 10 years ago. Uh, maybe this year I've done that, but that's because I've gone out and listen to the advice that Len give me. And that is, good things come to those that earn it. Uh, and I live by that motto. I will keep earning my stripes. I will keep showing people that I've given absolutely everything to this industry. And that I've done the miles. I've took the bumps. I've earned the respect. Um, and that if my chance arise, I deserve it. You know, there's no there's no, um, no two ways about it. Good things come to those that earn it. Absolutely. And uh, like I, said, I think you've lived up to your moniker of the prize fighter in 2022. Uh, you've had a phenomenal year. Um, I'm, I'm going to say it whether you'll back me up here, but I think uh, this has been one of the one of the best years of your career. Um, and like I, said, I think physically, mentally, performance wise, I think you've uh, out, out. I think you've outperformed yourself, really, and uh, outperformed a lot of the competition out there. Um, but uh, before we let you go, Zach, uh, an opportunity for you to throw out to my listeners and viewers any social medias where they can uh, reach out, say hi, get to know more about Zach Zodiac, Zach Knight, uh, and uh, maybe watch some of your footage if you've uh, got a YouTube channel or any merch to buy, my friend. But uh, where can they reach out and say hi? Um, so you can basically see everything that you've just said through my socials. I'm very active on there, uh, and I'm under the Zach Zodiac on all socials. Um, Facebook is, unfortunately, just a, a friend's thing. I, I don't use that for much promotional stuff. Uh, but Instagram and Twitter, you know, I'm very active and responsive with fans. Um, I want to basically just, you know, finish by saying that, you know, in January 2022, I claimed to the world that this was going to be my year. I didn't specify in what category that would be. But my sole aim this year was to finish this year as one of the top UK guys that people are talking about, that they sit back and my name has to be in the list. For one of the best years in the for UK talent. And the fact that you've said that and many people have said that, I've completed what I wanted to do this year, which is get back to the top level where people start believing in me. They're excited to see me and I'm producing good, solid matches that people appreciate. 2023, however, is a completely different year and I will push on. And I'm going to go as far to say that by this time next year, I'm really, really going to push and work harder than ever before to make sure I'm getting some form of contract. Whoever that will be with, it is now my life's work, my life's goal. This needs to now happen in the next 12 months from here. So, you know, people that have supported me uh, throughout this journey, I want to thank you. Um, you know, it really does mean a lot uh, with someone that would sit there and second guess himself and for so long didn't believe in himself to have you people back and believe in me and, you know, keep hyping me up and sharing everything that I'm putting out there and to be sat here on Jonah's uh, podcast, you know, this again is another huge achievement for me because this man, you know, has probably the very best UK podcast out there. Um, so I'm very humbled by that. And um, yeah, watch this space, 2023 year of the prize fighter.
Don't. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But I'm very excited for your future. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a blast speaking to you, Zach, and digging into your legendary 20, uh, 20 plus year career. Um, and it's not over yet. So many bright years ahead of you. But uh, uh, Zach Knight, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, buddy.